Jane takes a well-deserved break. Um, this morning we have Pastor Sarah Hubble here um, to... Um, <laughs>
and you know what it feels like to be nine months pregnant. Now imagine riding on a donkey uphill and downhill and in the desert. And it's really, really, really cold, so they probably wore these big wool shawls on top of themselves. Um, so it wasn't an easy journey. And they didn't have cell phones. They didn't have uh, little tablets that they could watch on their journey to pass the time. There were no movies, right? So it was a long journey, and it was really, really hard. But they made it to Bethlehem, um, and they Mary gave birth to the Son of God. So while we are enjoying our journey to Bethlehem and our journey to the birth of Jesus, let's also remember um, that it was a hard journey for Mary and Joseph to get there, but they had faith in God, and they made it. Um, at this time, I have some wonderful ladies coming forward to uh, light the Advent candles. Hi, I'm Darcy Porter. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, I'm Judy Nell. Good morning. The light flowing from our Advent grief is burning brighter. This radiance warms our hearts and fills us with joy. The Lord has done great things for us. Let us rejoice. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Let us pray. Dear God, we carry many burdens and worry over many things. Help us to hear your promise in this Advent season, that in hearing we may receive the Spirit's gift of joy. And may our spirits be kept sound at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <coughs> All right, at this time, the children can go down with Mrs. Sheldon to Sunday school this morning. Okay, this morning's scripture reading, we have two of them. Um, the first one comes from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Jesus answered him, it is written, one does not live, oh, sorry, this is the one, that's the second one, they're both from chapter, oh no, I got it, okay, rejoice in the Lord as always, again I will say rejoice, let your gentleness be known to everyone, the Lord is near, do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. And now we have Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. 
Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed to for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? And he said to them, Do not exhort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshold floor, threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the shaft will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. And the answer will always be five miles and half an hour. 
<laughs> he was true to his word when children and adults got a little itchy and fidgety and wanted to know when he would arrive at a destination. As his congregation approaches both Christmas but also the departure of Reverend Jane for a new church, and you begin to search for a new pastor, you may find it hard to wait, to wait with patience and expectation. That's hard work. During Advent, it is hard to wait expectantly, not just for the coming of Christmas, but also for the Christ proclaimed in the communion liturgy, the Christ who has died, the Christ who has risen, and the Christ who will come again in glory. And a closer look at the context of these scripture passages may shed light on the situation. And we need that light of God, do we not, to shine through these words? After all, this is the season of Advent, when we watch for the light of God to come into the world in Jesus. The Hebrew people had been waiting for hundreds of years to get God's word again from a bona fide prophet. John the baptizer certainly fits the mold. Unlike Isaiah, a temple priest who lived 700 years before John, Isaiah had been told to prophesy for three years naked and barefoot as a symbol of what would happen to Egypt. Now, if you don't believe me, check out Isaiah 20 for that. And if you don't think prophets are strange, well, that sounds pretty strange to me. <laughs> and here is John the baptizer. <clears throat> he wears clothes made of camel's hair and eats bugs and wild honey. He lives in the wilderness and calls on people to repent, which means to change your mind, to turn around, to change your attitudes and your behavior, to turn away from the things that distract you from God and turn towards the thing that God wants. And the people were hungry to hear what John had to say. They'd been living for hundreds of years in a wilderness of no word coming from God from a prophet. They were living at the time of John the baptizer and the time of Jesus under a crooked system of government, where the religious leader, who ordinarily was appointed because of being a religious person, the high priest now was appointed by the Roman authority. And there were a lot of high priests being appointed. And Ananias, who we'll hear about later in the Jesus story, had his son, his son-in-law, another son appointed, all because the Romans liked how good Ananias was at working with them. The temple and the Roman-controlled civil government were in league with each other. The Romans got their taxes. And the Jews got to practice their religion as defined by the high priest in various factions, including the Sadducees, Pharisees, and Herodians. In Matthew's Gospel, when John's calling out the brood of vipers, he addresses it directly to the Pharisees and Sadducees. Here, though, in Luke's Gospel, it's the whole crowd that's the target of his message. John didn't say that special status, like being a child of Abraham, made you exempt from God's critique. John didn't say that having no status made you more or less worthy of God's concern. God's concern is for everybody. The crowd members heard him and asked the critical question, what then should we do? And isn't that the question we need to be asking ourselves this Advent? How are you? How am I? Acting to delight in God. Find joy in God at all times by demonstrating our kindness, our gentleness, our compassion. Acts of love that bear fruit in our lives and in the life of the world near and far. John didn't deal in generalities. He's very specific. When wealthy people asked him what they needed to do, he answered, share what you have. When tax collectors who were Roman agents for collecting tolls and customs and duties were asked, and soldiers asked, what then should we do? John tells them, don't extort people. Don't lie. Don't accuse others and be a bully just to get more money and power. What then should we do here now in Paxton, in Massachusetts, 
in this nation this December? How do we prepare the way for the Lord? How do we bear good fruit? Fruit that welcomes God into our lives and into the lives of others. We can take a lesson from the people that went out to hear John. They waited a long time for God's prophet to appear. That meant they had waited with hope that God would be there. That God would live up to God's promise of loving God's people enough to send a Messiah who would be Emmanuel, one with them and one with us. The wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the prince of peace. In order to really hear God, John's message, though, they had to drop what they were doing and go out into the wilderness to find him. We have been surrounded by so much wilderness these days, have we not? COVID, school shootings, the tornadoes in Kentucky, massive fires and floods, the threat of war between Russia and Ukraine the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. I could go on and on, but we know wilderness, don't we? We know people that are suffering from loss of income, loss of jobs, all of which have been impacted in so many ways. We know about rising prices. One thing about wilderness is it strips away the illusion that we're in control of things. It's an invitation to not get caught in the trappings of Christmas preparations and instead to focus on making room in the ends of our own hearts for a Savior to come, one that we desperately need to welcome. It may feel uneasy being close to the wildness of God and of God's prophets, but perhaps like the Grinch, when he discovers that Christmas doesn't come in a store, that Christmas is about something more, our hearts can grow and grow and burst open with the desire to receive God in our lives, to share the gifts we've been given for the good of the world, to let our gentleness and kindness so show that when people meet us, they will know that we're Christians by the love that we express and demonstrate. Demonstrating that love for God, neighbors, and ourselves by what we do. Inspired by God's spirit and power, may we become more and more the people of God who welcome the Lord into our barns and inns, in workplaces and at home, on the street, in our neighborhoods, in that grocery store when the line is very long, like all of us in the boat on that Snake River float trip, we do have an idea that the journey is going to continue and will have an end. But we have no long how long that will take or how long it will be. In our next five miles or half an hour, Christ may come again in power. We could choose, however, how we <coughs> choose to live while we're on that journey. We can choose to live with joy. On that poster, we saw eagles and wildlife, and things were seen, but we would not have seen them had we, if we hadn't been awake to the journey, awake to the moment, alive in the presence. One person recently defined joy this way. It's being mindful. Mindfulness plus gratitude equals joy. We have this time, this gift of grace, John tells us, prepare the way for the Lord. Bear good fruit. Let us make room for changed attitudes and changed lives, following the way of Christ. One prayer, one shared coat, one act of hospitality, one <coughs> act of protest of an injustice witness, one act of kindness at a time. Anne Weems summarizes some of what we can do this Advent in her poem in search of our kneeling places. In each heart lies a Bethlehem, an inn where we must ultimately answer where there is room or not. When we are Bethlehem bound, we can no longer look the other way, conveniently not see 
starts for hearing angel voices. <coughs> we can no longer excuse ourselves by busily tending our sheep or our kingdoms. This Advent lets go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing the Lord has made known to us. In the midst of shopping sprees, let's ponder in our hearts the gift of gifts. Through the tinsel, let's look for the gold of the Christmas star. In the excitement and confusion, in the merry chaos, let's listen to the brush of angel wings. This Advent, let's go to Bethlehem and find our kneeling places, our places before the manger. Amen. I invite us to just take a minute to reflect. Invite us now in a spirit of prayer to open our hearts and our lives to the one who is coming and is already here. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that we are on this Advent journey together. We give you thanks, God, that we can be together as a congregation this morning after all the struggles that have happened and this year and the year before we thank you God for the joy that you hold out to us even as we join Mary and Joseph on that long journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem with all the ups and downs the highs and lows Thank you, God, for being with us no matter what. And God, we now invite prayers for people that have joys and concerns in their own hearts. I invite you now, if you have a joy or concern, to say it out loud, to share in this congregational space. <coughs> My mother has COVID very well. Prayers for a mother with COVID. I have a prayer to my daughter who has COVID. So prayers for her as well. And it was breakthrough cases. In fact, for Tyler's 14th birthday. We give thanks to God. Are there others? Gracious God, you know that there are prayers that are too fragile for words. And we invite you now in the silence as we allow your spirit to lift up those prayers and concerns. Lord Jesus, when you came among us, you gave us words to pray when we didn't have the words. And I invite us all now to join together in the words that Jesus gave us to pray to God. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, 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 hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins.
John was pretty specific. He said share if you were able to. And in that spirit, I ask us now to share <coughs> as we re receive the morning offering.
May God bless you and keep you. And God may his peace to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace and joy and hope and love. The love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go forth now with joy to be the people of God. Amen. Amen. Amen.